This is a camera that can see sound. In other words, it can show you where in a scene sounds are coming from. How acoustic cameras work and what they're capable of is remarkable. But before we get into that, I went to an anechoic chamber to have a play with one. Here's me playing the ukulele and talking at the same time. It's interesting that the sound appears to switch between coming from my mouth and coming from the ukulele, even though sometimes both are making a sound at the same time. And brilliantly, this is completely analogous to a traditional light-based camera. What we have here is an issue of dynamic range. If you have your camera set to automatic exposure, which your smartphone is by default, and you shoot a video of a dim light, then turn on a much brighter light, the camera will switch between showing you lots of detail of the dim light to showing you lots of detail of the bright light. And the same thing is happening here with the ukulele. The ukulele is louder than my voice, so when the ukulele is being played, the acoustic camera dials down its sensitivity and you can no longer see my voice. But when I stop strumming the ukulele, the camera dials up the sensitivity and then you can see my voice. What's really cool is that because my voice is in a different frequency range to the ukulele, it's possible to isolate just my voice and ignore the ukulele or vice versa. And actually this starts to hint at one of the industrial applications for acoustic cameras. One really noisy appliance is a vacuum cleaner. It just seems like a cacophony of sound. But look at this spectrogram, which is like a heat map of the different frequencies that the vacuum cleaner is producing. You can see that there are a handful of really strong frequencies. With the acoustic camera software, you can isolate different frequencies. So look, this frequency here we now can see is from the tube of the vacuum cleaner. So we now know that the tube of the vacuum cleaner resonates at 400 hertz. And we can see that the motor of the vacuum cleaner produces a frequency of 7,000 hertz. And all this is really useful information if you're trying to engineer a quieter appliance. Another cool trick is once you have the recording, you can use something akin to the eyedropper tool in Photoshop to point at different parts of the recording and see what just that part sounds like. How cool is that? Thanks, by the way, to Ian McFarlane from Axoft who supply acoustic cameras in the UK. Check them out in the description for all your acoustic camera needs. They're not paying me to say that, by the way. And thanks also to Manny and to Zami and the Birmingham Centre for Railway Research Education at the University of Birmingham who hosted the whole thing. Why would a railway research facility be interested in using an acoustic camera? Well, here's one setup trackside. And as trains go by, you can identify what wheels are making a noise and need maintenance. Without this kind of monitoring, often the first you know about a problem with a train is when it breaks down in service, which causes delays and costs money. Like imagine the lost productivity if all these people were late for work. I actually realized I've got this hypothesis that I could test using the acoustic cameras. There's this demo that I used to do for live shows, like, you know, science shows for kids, where you get an aluminum rod like this and you pinch it in the middle and then with a bit of rosin between your fingers, you pinch along the rod and Headphone warning, it makes a horribly high-pitched sound. It's horrible, isn't it? The question is, how is the rod vibrating? Is it vibrating in the same way that like when you twang a ruler, waggling like that? Or is it more like, you know, when you pluck a guitar string, so it's kind of like, you know, it's going like that? Well, depending on how it's vibrating, the sound would be coming from different parts of the rod. And you can see here that the sound is coming from the very tips of the rod. And that's consistent with a really unexpected vibrational mode, where the rod is essentially contracting and then expanding and contracting and expanding. One thing that's insanely cool about acoustic cameras is the frame rate. Like, a typical frame frame rate for a camera is 60 frames per second. That's what I film my YouTube videos in. But when you record sound, you're typically sampling at about 
40,000 samples per second. And when you translate that to an acoustic camera, that's 40,000 frames per second. So by accident, acoustic cameras are also high speed cameras, which means you can do things like film what an echo looks like and then play it back in super slow motion. Before we get to that though, I want to explain how acoustic cameras work. And actually this relates to a video I made a while back about how humans detect where sounds are coming from. Link to that in the card in the description, but here's a quick summary of the salient part. We detect where sounds are coming from based on the timings of sound reaching our two ears. So if a sound is coming from directly in front, it'll reach both ears at the same time. And that's how we know it's coming from in front. But suppose there's a delay of 0.3 milliseconds, that tells our brain the sound is coming from like off to one side, like over there, but actually it could also be coming from over there, couldn't it? Because the delay would be the same, or like up there at an angle, or down there. In fact, there's a whole region of possible places the sound could be coming from, and that region is called the cone of confusion, though technically it's a hyperboloid of confusion. Here's an illustration of that. The two yellow dots are the ears, and here is the cone of possible locations of a sound for which the delay between the two ears is the same. So how do you reduce that surface of possible sound locations down to a single point? Well, the human brain has lots of clever ways of doing that, but for a device like an acoustic camera, you just need to add more ears. Like here, look, imagine if I added a third ear. Well, the same sound source will create a new cone based on the delay between this pair of ears. So now we know that the sound must be coming from a point that rests on both of these cones. In other words, somewhere along this intersecting line. You might be thinking, well, there's another pairing of ears we haven't looked at. These two ears make another cone. But actually, the way the maths works out, all three cones intersect at the same hyperbola. So to really pinpoint the location of a sound, you need a fourth ear. A fourth ear would give us three new ear pairings and therefore three new cones of confusion. But if I showed all three new cones, that would be confusing. But just by adding one of them, we can see that it passes through the hyperbola in just one place. So with four ears, you should be able to locate the exact direction and distance to the sound source. So why do these acoustic cameras need more than four ears? Well, what if there were two sound sources simultaneously? In that scenario, two microphones would receive completely different sounds. That's because the sounds from the two sources would overlap differently because of the different travel times to the two different microphones. That's okay for humans because humans are good at filtering sounds in all sorts of clever ways. But for software, that's a problem. Problem. So instead, what the software does is analyze individual frequencies instead of the whole waveform. So where a human brain is trying to match up complex waveforms, the acoustic camera is looking at individual frequencies and the difference in phase at the two microphones. And it turns out that when you're looking at different frequencies individually, the distance between mics becomes really important. For any given frequency, there's an optimum distance between mics. So by having lots of mics, you can have a range of different distances between mics. And so you'll be able to analyze more frequencies more accurately. In my previous video that I mentioned earlier, I talk about why a high frequency sound is problematic for microphones that are far apart. And actually, it's problematic for human ears as well. So I won't repeat myself, but the link is in the description. But anyway, all this explains why this acoustic camera, also from g Tech, has mics that are irregularly spaced. If the mics were placed at regular intervals, you would have some repeating distances between pairs of mics. Like, all these distances are the same, all these distances are the same. By having irregularly spaced mics, you cover a greater range of distances between mics. How acoustic cameras work is more complicated than I've presented here. Like, for example, having more mics gives you essentially better resolution, but it's beyond the scope of this video. I kind of glossed over the fact that you get depth information from an array of microphones. So here's a more recent model from g Tech that takes advantage of that. The video camera in the middle of this one captures depth information. So when you're traveling around an object, you're basically scanning it. You can then map the sound onto that 3D object and look around it. How cool is that? But the coolest thing for me was watching an echo propagate around the room. This is Paul. After the initial clap, which is obviously centered on his hands, you start to see these other hotspots 
flashing around the screen where the sound is bouncing off walls. The echo itself takes milliseconds, but you can see all this detail in slow motion. So flipping cool. The echo pattern looks quite a bit different when you're in the corner of a room. I'm really interested in the logic behind different business models, like food delivery apps, for example. I'm hungry, I don't wanna cook, I don't wanna go out, and I want lots of choice. Food delivery apps, the logic is incredibly straightforward. And so is the logic behind the sponsor of this video, Incogni. They offer something that you want, but you don't wanna do yourself, but it's not food delivery. Why am I hungry now? Here's what Incogni offers. There are these companies called data brokers, that collect data about you and then sell it on to other people. You don't know who they're selling it to, but you can contact them and say, stop doing that and also delete my data. The problem is there are thousands of these companies and they all want to be contacted in different ways. And sometimes they'll reject your request and you have to appeal and all this sort of stuff. It would take months to do it yourself. And actually it took Incogni months to do it the first time, but now they've automated it all. One company has done all the hard work and now we can all benefit from it. So now I can just sign up to Incogni, give them permission to act on my behalf and they just take care of it. I've been with Incogni for a little while so I can show you the progress. Look, these are all the companies that have confirmed that they now don't have my data. It's a really unobtrusive service which I value. It just happens in the background but it's funny, like it's so unobtrusive that I was saying to my wife the other day, you know, I don't get any of those weird phone calls anymore from companies I don't recognize who seem to know a lot about me. Maybe the UK have changed legislation so that companies can't do that. Oh, no, wait, hold on. It's incognito, isn't it? <laughs> like, I just hadn't put, you know, it's, I, I forgot. And that's it, you know, it's peace of mind. You just do it and then that thing that you were supposed to do, you've done it. The promo on this one is three times better than it was last month. The first 100 people to go to incogni.com forward slash science and use promo code science at checkout will get 60% off. The link is also in the description, so check out Incogni today.